Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my name is Dr. Vijay Sagar. I am the professor and head of the Department of Anatomy at Sri Ramachandra Institute of Medical Sciences, Chennai. In this topic, we will be dealing with the gross anatomy of tongue. Okay, students, let's hear from you. What are the various things, clinical things of importance which you know about the tongue? Glossitis. Okay, glossitis is one. What else? Uh, microglossia. Microglossia, very good. Anything else? Macroglossia. Macroglossia. Anything else? Have you heard of carcinoma of the tongue? Yes. Okay. You must have heard of carcinoma of the tongue. And when you have gone to a doctor, most of the times, what is the first thing he does? One of the first thing he does is he asks you to show your tongue. So the tongue can be used as a great diagnostic tool, which we will be seeing at the end of the lecture. We will be talking about a condition called as ankyloglossia. What is ankyloglossia? That is when the frenulum of the tongue attaches the tongue to the floor of the mouth. It is a condition which is called as ankyloglossia. We will discuss about bleeding from the tongue, paralysis of the hypoglossal nerve, carcinoma of the tongue and paralysis of a very important muscle of the tongue which is called as genioglossus. So all these are parts of clinical anatomy which we will review at the end of this lecture. First, let us study about the gross anatomy of the tongue. As an introduction, the tongue is referred as glossa in Greek and there is a Latin word called lingua which refers to the tongue. So hypoglossal, glossal refers to the tongue, lingua, lingual artery, it is a term which is derived from the Latin word lingua which refers to the tongue. Now as you all know, the tongue is a muscular organ and it comprises of skeletal muscles, lymphoid tissue, mixed glands. And there is a fibrous septum in the center which divides the tongue into two parts and some amount of fat is also present within the tongue. Now the functions of the tongue notably is the taste. The taste sensation is something all of us are familiar with. We have the four basic senses of taste. At the tip of the tongue we feel the sensation of sweetness. On the sides we feel the sensation of salty and sourness and at the back of the tongue we can feel the sensation of bitterness. In addition, there is a new taste or the taste of umami, which is actually a savory sensation which is associated with uh, monosodium glutamate, which is ajinomoto. And this is a savory uh, taste which actually comes from cooked meats. And this taste is generally friend all over the central parts of the tongue. So you have the basic taste of the tongue or uh, basic sensations which include taste sensations which include sweet, salty, sour and bitter. And then there is the taste of umami which is felt all over the central parts of the tongue. In addition to the sensation of taste, the tongue helps in mastication of food. It helps in the swallowing of food. It is very essential for articulated speech. It is of course an organ of gesture and expression and it is an organ for suckling by the infants. So these are the basic sensation functions of the tongue. Now let us see the parts of the tongue. If you see this particular picture. This is the dorsal surface of the tongue and this is the ventral surface of the tongue. The dorsal surface of the tongue is divided into two parts. The front which is in the part which is in front in the oral cavity is the oral part of the tongue and the part of the tongue which goes towards the pharynx towards the back this is the pharyngeal part of the tongue. The part which extends from the mandible from the mandible to the hyoid bone this part is called as the root of the tongue and this part extending from the tip to the mandible attachment to the mandible this part comprises of the ventral surface of the tongue. So the tongue has two surfaces an oral surface and a ventral surface. The oral surface is again divided into two parts an anterior part which is the oral part located in the oral cavity and a posterior part the pharyngeal part which is located in the pharynx. On the dorsum of the tongue you see a prominent V-shaped sulcus. This sulcus here is called as the sulcus terminalis. Uh, 
So, the part in front of the sulcus terminalis, this is the body of the tongue and the posterior part is called as the base of the tongue and this of course, the tip, this is the tip of the tongue and the sides are called as the margins of the tongue. So, let us recapitulate, what, what are the parts of the tongue? What are the surfaces? You have a dorsal surface and you have a ventral surface. The dorsal surface is divided into two parts, an anterior part which is the oral part and a posterior part which is the pharyngeal part. The ventral surface ex extends from the tip to the mandible. The root is the attachment of the tongue to the floor of the mouth and extends from the mandible to the hyoid bone. So, these are the parts of the tongue. Now, let us have a detailed look on the dorsal surface. This is the midline fibrous septum which divides the tongue into two parts and this is the prominent sulcus terminalis. This is, look at this purple part, this is the oropiglottis which is present in the pharynx and you see the septum here extending from the back of the tongue to the epiglottis. This fold is called as the median glossoepiglottic fold. Now, look on the sides, there is another fold which is extending from the tongue to the lateral wall of the pharynx and this one is called as the lateral glossoepiglottic fold. So, you have a median glossoepiglottic fold extending from the midline to the epiglottis and a lateral glossoepiglottic fold extending from the tongue to the epiglottis. In between these two folds, there is a circular depression on either side of the median glossoepiglottic fold and what is that depression called as? Good, that depression is called as the vallecula. Now, look on the posterior surface here. There are two folds which extend from the pharynx to the palate and from the tongue to the palate. So, this fold which is extending from the pharynx to the palate is called as the palatopharyngeal fold and this fold which is extending from the tongue to the palate is called as the palatoglossal fold. So, you have two folds or arches like this, one going from the tongue to the palate, one going from the pharynx to the palate. So, this is the palatoglossal fold and this is the palatopharyngeal fold and what is the prominent structure which is present in, in between the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal fold? That is where the palatine tonsils are located. So, if you look at this picture, this is the palatine tonsil which is located in the V which is formed by the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal folds. Now, look at the sides here on the posterior part, you see a large amount of lymphat lymphatic tissue. This lymphatic tissue in the posterior part of the tongue is together called as the lingual tonsil. So, this lingual tonsil is nothing but the aggregation of lymphoid tissue in the posterior one third of the tongue. Now, look at the anterior one third of the tongue. The anterior one third of the tongue just in front of the sulcus terminalis, there are prominent papillae which are called as the circumvallate papillae. The anterior two-thirds of the tongue contains three types of papillae. What are the three types of papillae? You have the filiform papillae, the fungiform papillae and the circumvallate papillae. The filiform papillae are present all over the front and sides of the tongue. The fungiform papillae are most prominently seen on the sides of the tongue whereas the circumvallate papillae are typically seen just in front of the sulcus terminalis. Now, let us have a look at the ventral surface of the tongue. That is, if you lift the tongue upwards, this is what you will see. This is the uplifted surface, you are seeing the ventral surface of the tongue. The midline of the tongue shows a fold of tissue which is called as the frenulum. The posterior part of the frenulum is attached to the uh, floor of the mouth, whereas normally the entire front parts or the anterior portions of the frenulum are free. The deep lingual vein, if you see, is present lateral to the frenulum. And most of the times, the mucous membrane is so thin that the darkish blue discoloration of the lingual veins are seen on either side of the frenulum. Further laterally, you have a fold of mucous membrane which is called as plica fimbriata. These are seen on either side of the deep lingual veins. If you look posteriorly, there is a fold which is seen here. This is the sublingual fold. It is a fold of mucous membrane which is running and covering the submandibular duct. What is the other name for the submandibular duct? Wharton's duct. So, the submandibular duct is also called as the Wharton's duct. Remember that the sublingual fold, a fold of mucous membrane which is present over the submandibular duct and the sublingual papilla are two small openings on either side of the midline at the posterior part of the ventral surface.
and the sublingual papilla is the opening of the duct of the submandibular gland. Please remember that the sublingual papilla is the opening of the submandibular ducts and where do the sublingual glands open? The sublingual glands open on the floor of the mouth on either side by multiple small openings. So, you remember parotid gland has a definite duct which is the parotid duct which opens into the, where does it open? It opens into the vestibule of the mouth opposite the upper second molar. You have the submandibular gland which opens into the sublingual papilla on the ventral surface on the floor of the mouth. And finally, you have the sublingual glands which open multiple glands which are opening on the floor of the mouth. So, this is the ventral surface of the tongue. Now, let us come to the muscles which comprise the tongue. Broadly, there are two categories of muscles which form the tongue. These include the extrinsic muscles and the intrinsic muscles. Extrinsic muscles are those which originate outside the tongue and are inserted into the tongue. And what are intrinsic muscles? Intrinsic muscles are those, as the name suggests, intrinsic muscles are th those which originate and end within the tongue itself. Now, what is the basic difference between an extrinsic muscle and an intrinsic muscle? Action. What is the basic difference in action? Extrinsic muscles change the position of the tongue. Intrinsic muscles change the shape of the tongue. So, the extrinsic muscles include the genioglossus. The bulk of the tongue is formed of this particular muscle which is called as genioglossus which extends from the mandible and into the tongue. The hyoglossus extends from the hyoid bone and is inserted into the sides of the tongue. The palatoglossus originates from the palatine aponeurosis and inserted into the posterior part and sides of the tongue. And finally, you have styloglossus which extends from the styloid process and inserts into the sides of the tongue. Additionally, there is a small muscle called chondroglossus. The chondroglossus is nothing but a detached part of hyoglossus and also extends from the hyoid bone to the sides of the tongue. So, the extrinsic muscles include, what are the extrinsic muscles? They include genioglossus, hyoglossus, styloglossus and palatoglossus. In addition, you have a small muscle which is called as chondroglossus which is nothing but a detached part of hyoglossus. Then you have the intrinsic muscles superior longitudinal, inferior longitudinal, transverse and vertical. We will see those shortly. In this picture, you see the attachments of the extrinsic muscles. The hyoglossus extends from the hyoid bone to the sides and posterior part of the tongue. The genioglossus extends from the genial tubercles on the posterior aspect of the front of the mandible and is inserted into the tongue and the genioglossus forms the bulk of the musculature of the tongue. You have the styloglossus muscle extending from the styloid process into the sides of the tongue and you have the palatoglossus which extends from the palatine aponeurosis and is inserted into the sides of the posterior part of the tongue. Now we come to the intrinsic group of muscles. The intrinsic group of muscles as we just now discussed, the intrinsic group of muscles as we just now discussed include the superior longitudinal group, the inferior longitudinal group the horizontal group and the vertical group. In this picture, you see the superior longitudinal group running along the upper surface of the tongue, the inferior longitudinal group running along the inferior surface of the tongue, the horizontal group extending from the fibrous septum towards the side of the tongue and the vertical group running vertically between the superior and the inferior longitudinal group of muscles. So, you have four sets of intrinsic muscles, the superior longitudinal, the inferior longitudinal, the horizontal group which extend from the midline fibrous septum sidewards horizontally and you have a vertical group which is running between the superior and the inferior longitudinal group of muscles. So, now let us come to the function of the muscles. The extrinsic muscles very importantly change the position of the tongue. The protraction, the movement of protraction that is pulling the, the tongue forwards is brought about by the anterior fibers of genioglossus. Retraction that is pulling the tongue backwards into the oral cavity is caused by styloglossus and hyoglossus. Depression of the tongue towards the floor of the mouth is brought about by hyoglossus and the middle and the posterior fibers of genioglossus. Retraction and elevation of the posterior one third of the tongue is caused by styloglossus and palatoglossus. So, if you have a quick review, you see that note that the genioglossus has two sets of actions. 
the anterior fibers of junior glossus cause protraction that is bring the tongue forwards the middle and the posterior fibers of junior glossus help in depression of the tongue so the junior glossus has two functions anterior fibers cause protraction whereas the middle and the posterior fibers cause depression now let us come to the intrinsic muscles what will the intrinsic muscles do if the superior longitudinal group contracts what ha happens to the dorsum of the tongue if the superior longitudinal group contracts the dorsum of the tongue will become concave if the inferior longitudinal group contracts what will happen the dorsal surface becomes convex if the horizontal group contracts and they contract towards the midline what will happen to the tongue the tongue will become narrow and long what will happen if the transverse group contracts the tongue will become broad and flat so in summary superior longitudinal group makes the dorsum of the tongue concave inferior longitudinal group makes the dorsum of the tongue convex the horizontal group makes the tongue narrow and thick and the vertical group makes the tongue broad and flat now let us look at the nerve supply of the tongue the nerve supply of the tongue is very very important because we are talking about three different things here we are talking about the motor nerve supply to the tongue we are talking of sensations of taste from the tongue and we are talking about sensations which are general sensations of what are the general sensations of pain temperature touch and pressure so we are talking of three particular components we are talking about the motor nerve supply we are talking about taste sensations and we are talking about general sensations which include sensations of pain temperature touch and pressure now you see the anterior two thirds the anterior two thirds and this is the posterior one third and this is the posterior most part of the tongue the general sensations from the anterior two thirds of the tongue are carried by the lingual nerve the taste sensations from the anterior two thirds are carried by corda tympani which is actually a branch of the facial nerve which is running with the lingual nerve the taste and general sensations from the posterior one third of the tongue are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve and the taste and general sensations from the posterior most parts of the tongue are carried by the vagus nerve that is the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve so you have three parts of the tongue general sensations anterior two thirds general sensations are carried by the lingual nerve anterior two thirds taste sensations are being carried by the corda tympani branch of the facial nerve which is running along with the lingual nerve the posterior one third general sensations and taste sensations both are being carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve and the posterior most part of the tongue the general sensations and taste are both being carried by the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve coming to the motor supply all extrinsic muscles and all intrinsic muscles are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve except the palatoglossus which is supplied by the vago accessory complex that is a complex of nerves which is having contribution from both the vagus nerve and the accessory nerve so the palatoglossus is the only muscle which is supplied by the vago accessory complex whereas the rest of the extrinsic muscles are being supplied by the hypoglossal nerve so a detailed look at this the hypoglossal nerve supplies efferent motor fibers to all the muscles except the palatoglossus which is supplied by the vago accessory complex the corda tympani remember carries two sets of fibers one set of fibers we have just now discussed the afferent taste fibers are carried by the corda tympani to the gustatory nucleus in the cranial part of the nucleus of tractus solitarius so these are fibers which are afferent taste fibers that is the fibers are going from the taste sensations are going from the tongue to its nucleus that is the gustatory nucleus and the nucleus of tractus solitarius there is a set of efferent fibers which run through the corda tympani and these include the efferent preganglionic parasympathetic fibers which originate from which salivary nucleus the superior salivary nucleus and run via the corda tympani and run, reach the lingual nerve and terminate in the submandibular ganglion so these are the two sets of fibers which are running in the corda tympani one are the afferent taste fibers being carried by the corda tympani and the second set of fibers include the efferent preganglionic parasympathetic fibers to the submandibular ganglion the lingual nerve carries general sensations to the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve also carry general sensations to the spinal nucleus
they also carry taste sensations to the same gustatory nucleus. This is very, very important. You need to remember where are these taste fibers ending? All the taste fibers are finally ending in the gustatory nucleus, which is located in the cranial part of the nucleus of tractus solitarius, which is present in which part of the brainstem? Which is present in the medulla of the brainstem. The general sensations of taste, uh, the general sensations of temperature, touch, and pressure, all these reach the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Now let us have a look at the arterial supply of the tongue. The lingual artery is a branch of the external carotid artery. What are the other branches from the external carotid artery? You have the superior thyroid artery, okay. what else? You have the ascending pharyngeal, facial, lingual. What are the posterior branches? occipital artery, posterior auricular artery and there are two terminal branches which are the two terminal branches of the external carotid, the superficial temporal and the maxillary arteries. So, lingual artery is a branch of the external carotid artery and note that this particular in this particular picture this is the hyoglossus muscle. Remember the hyoglossus muscle? The hyoglossus muscle is an extrinsic muscle which is extending from the hyoid bone into the sides of the tongue. Note that the, there are two nerves which lie on top of the hyoglossus that is they, if the hyoglossus muscle is running like this, there are two nerves which are lying superficial to the hyoglossus muscle which are these two important nerves. These include the lingual nerve and the hypoglossal nerve and note the course of the lingual artery. The lingual artery passes deep to hyoglossus. So, if you have two hyoglossus muscles extending from the hyoid bone into the sides of the tongue you have two nerves on the superficial aspect of the hyoglossus. These include the lingual nerve above and the hypoglossal nerve below and the lingual artery passes deep to the hyoglossus muscle. So, you can see the lingual artery here running deep to the hyoglossus muscle. As it runs deep to the hyoglossus muscle, it gives numerous branches which are called as dorsal lingual arteries and finally continues as the deep lingual artery which reaches near the tip of the tongue. So, this is the course of the lingual artery originating from the external carotid passing under the hyoglossus giving these dorsal lingual arteries and finally terminating as the deep lingual artery. On the superficial surface of the hyoglossus muscle you have two important nerves the lingual nerve and the hypoglossal nerve and note that this this particular duct. What is this duct? What is this duct? The submandibular duct loops across this lingual nerve. This is the looping of the submandibular duct across the lingual nerve and see that the submandibular duct is opening near the floor of the mouth here. Now, we come to the venous drainage. The deep lingual veins, the deep lingual veins are joined by the dorsal lingual veins to form the lingual vein and this lingual vein drains into the internal jugular vein. So, you have the deep lingual veins which are being joined by the dorsal lingual veins which finally ends in the uh, internal jugular vein. In addition, you must remember that there is a large network of veins which is present around the hypoglossal nerve. These are called as venae com comitantes of the hypoglossal nerve and these form a bulk of the these venae comitantes form an anastomotic channel and usually they join the common facial vein, but sometimes these venae comitantes can join the lingual veins. The venae comitantes are also called as the ranine veins, there is a special name for them ranine veins. So, if you summarize the arterial supply, the arterial supply is by the lingual artery which is coming from the external carotid artery, it gives the dorsal lingual arteries and the deep lingual arteries. If you see the venous drainage, the deep lingual veins are joined by the dorsal lingual veins to form the lingual vein which drains into the internal jugular vein. Additionally, there is a venous network around the hypoglossal nerve. This is called as venae, competent, venae comitantes around the hypoglossal nerve and these usually join the common facial vein, but occasionally can join the lingual vein as well. Now, we come to a very important part which is the lymphatic drainage of the tongue. This is very, very important because carcinoma of the tongue usually spreads by way of lymph nodes. So, you must remember, first let us have a look at the various lymph nodes which are present here. 
Under the chin, you have a set of lymph nodes which are called as the submental lymph nodes. On the sides of the mandible, just below the mandible here on the sides, you have the lymph nodes which are called as the submandibular group of lymph nodes. Along the internal jugular vein, in the upper part, you have a set of nodes which are called as the jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes. This jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes are also called as the upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes. Now look lower down in the picture, there are a set of lymph nodes here. These are called as the jugulohomohyoid group of lymph nodes. These are also called as the lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes. So if you recapitulate, what are the lymph nodes we have just now seen? Under the mandible, what do you have here? Under the chin, you have the submantle. Sub Under the sides, you have submandibular. In the upper part of the internal jugular vein, you have the jugulodigastric, also called as the upper deep cervical. And lower down, you have the jugulohomohyoid, or also called as the lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes. Now, note this that the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue has a bilateral drainage to the submental sub lymph nodes. Tip of the tongue has a bilateral drainage to the submental lymph nodes. That is, from the tip of the tongue, lymph drains to lymph nodes on both sides, submental lymph nodes of the both sides. The central parts of the tongue of the anterior two-thirds note has a bilateral drainage to the submandibular and then onwards to the jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes. So, what you have here is the tip of the tongue which is dailing, draining into the submental group of lymph nodes on either side and then you have the central parts of the anterior two-thirds which are having a bilateral drainage that is they drain to both sides which group of lymph nodes submandibular group of lymph nodes and then onwards that lymph from there flows to the lower deep cervical or the jugulohomohyoid group of lymph nodes again now note this the sides of the tongue in the previous slide we have discussed the central parts of the tongue of the anterior two-thirds the sides of the tongue of the anterior two-thirds has a unilateral drainage to the submandibular lymph nodes and then onwards to the jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes. So from here, the sides of the tongue, it drains to, to the submandibular sub group of lymph nodes and from here, it goes on to the jugulohomohyoid group of lymph nodes. The entire posterior two-thirds, including the sides of the tongue, drain bilaterally into the upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes, which are also called as the jugulohomohyoid group of lymph nodes. I will show you uh, another picture. This is in this picture, it is very, very clear. Look at this part. The tip of the tongue has a bilateral drainage to the submental lymph nodes of both sides. The, in the anterior two thirds, the central parts of the tongue have a bilateral drainage to the bilateral submandibular group of lymph nodes. In the anterior two thirds, the sides of the anterior two thirds drain into the unilateral submandibular group of lymph nodes. And from the submandibular group of lymph nodes, lymph drains to the lower deep cervical or also called as the jugulohomohyoid group of lymph nodes. Now note that the lymph from the entire posterior one-third of the tongue, this entire posterior parts, posterior one-thirds, is draining bilaterally into the upper deep cervical or the jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes from whence the lymph will finally will drain into the jugulohomohyoid or the lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes. So let us hear from you what is the area of lymphatic drainage. So I will give you the heading, you tell me. Tip of the tongue will drain to submental lymph nodes bilaterally. Okay. Anterior two thirds central parts will drain into bilateral submandibular group of lymph nodes from where the lymph will drain into jugulohomohyoid or the lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes and then sides of the anterior two-thirds will drain unilateral submandibular lymph nodes which finally again drains into the lower, lower deep cervical or jugulohomohyoid group of lymph nodes and about the posterior most one-third where does that drain into posterior one-third bilateral drainage into the upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes from where the lymph finally will drain into the lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes. So that is about the lymphatic drainage of the tongue. With this, we now come, come to the applied anatomy. The mucous membrane, as I had mentioned earlier, can be used as a diagnostic tool. A dry tongue indicates dehydration. A pale tongue 
indicates anemia that is lack of hemoglobin hemoglobin a smooth tongue is usually seen due to dentures when people wear dentures for a prolonged period of time the surface of the tongue which normally is rough why is the norm, uh, surface of the tongue normally rough because of the presence of papillae the papillae makes the surface of the tongue rough so when this dentures are there the surface of the tongue dorsal surface becomes usually very very smooth there is a sore and a beefy red tongue which is caused by deficiency of vitamin b12 there is a condition called as menopausal glossitis which occurs due to diminished estrogens in the women of uh, menopausal age there is a condition called as a geographical tongue it looks like a geography map you have multiple patches over the tongue it's of course a very benign condition does not happen in everybody it happens only in about 1 to 3 percentage of people what happens is multiple patches of uh, discoloration on the dorsal surface of the tongue tongue and it appears more like a geography map on the dorsal surface so that's what is called as a geographical tongue and sometimes in conditions called as oral hairy leukoplakia there is white hair on the sides of the tongue and this is a classical uh, incidence of ebv virus infection epstein barr virus infection in patients with hiv so this kind of oral hairy leukoplakia is seen in patients of hiv longitudinal furrows on the dorsal surface of the tongue are indicative of syphilis then there are multiple uh, ulcers which are occur on the surface of the tongue these are called as after ulcers now after ulcers could be minor ulcers they could be major ulcers there could be herpetiform ulcers you will read all about these when you go into clinical terms after minor ulcers are usually less than 2 mm in diameter major after ulcers are usually more than a centimeter in diameter and herpeto herpetiform ulcers are multiple small uh, ulcers which coalesce to form a larger ulcer so that is what is called as a herpetiform ulcer now recurrent after ulcers are usually indicative of a systemic infection like crohn's disease ulcerative colitis herpes simplex uh, infection basset syndrome all these cause recurrent after ulcers and of course a single non healing erythematous painful ulcer a single ulcer which is red in color which is non healing which is long standing is usually indicative of a carcinomatous uh, growth in the tongue so these are the various things which we can find out just by having a look at the tongue so this is a mucous membrane of the tongue can function as a very good diagnostic tool now the lingual veins as we have studied in this lesson lie very superficial to the mucous membrane and therefore are capable of rapid absorption of drugs you must have heard of a tablet called sorbitrate next we come to the lingual veins the lingual veins are very superficial and are capable of rapid absorption of drugs you must have heard of this medicine called sorbitrate this is usually a life saving drug and it is usually placed in the floor of the tongue of a person who is suffering from angina this will uh, quickly relieve the vasospasm now as you know the tongue is a highly vascular organ and in, there are incidents when especially patients having epileptic fits can bite their tongues and this can cause profuse bleeding there can be profuse bleeding from the tongue but since the tongue is so vascular it usually results in very good healing now if there is a paralysis of the hypoglossal nerve what is the basic function of the hypoglossal nerve all muscles of the tongue are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve except the palatoglossus which is supplied by the vago accessory complex and what happens is when the 12th nerve gets paralyzed the genioglossus also gets paralyzed the main function of the genioglossus if you ask a patient to pull out his tongue is to pull out the tongue and put it into the midline so one genioglossus will pull out the tongue and put, tries to put it towards the midline this genioglossus will also pull out the tongue and put it towards the midline so the net action is the tongue is pulled forwards and is present in the midline so what happens if say genioglossus of one side gets cut so sorry the hypoglossal nerve of one side gets cut what will happen is what will happen this side is functional this side is not functional so this side will overact and this side will pull the tongue out and deviate it towards the side of the lesion that is where the hypoglossal nerve has got cut so if the hypoglossal nerve is injured on the right side if you ask the patient to pull out his tongue 
the tongue will come out and go towards the right side because the left side of genioglossus is overacting and instead of putting it in the midline, since there is no other muscle to compensate from the opposite side, the tongue will deviate to the opposite side. Now there is a condition, we have talked about carcinoma of the tongue, we have talked about the lymphatic drainage. A carcinoma of the tongue uh, usually has a very rapid spread and what is done is usually a commando operation in which there is the excision of the affected side of the tongue that is one side of the tongue is removed. There is a hemimandibulectomy that is the mandible of that particular side is removed and it involves extensive lymph node removal which includes the submental lymph nodes, the submandibular lymph nodes and the jugular digastric and the jugular homohyoid group of lymph nodes. So this is what is called as a commando operation in which a part of the tongue is removed, the mandible part of the mandible is removed and all the involved lymph nodes on both sides are removed. Then there is a condition I had talked about earlier which is called as ankyloglossia. The other name for tongue, ankyloglossia is tongue tie. Now what happens in this condition is there is an unduly long frenulum. You remember the frenulum on the undersurface of the mouth? That frenulum, the entire frenulum connects the tongue to the undersurface of the mouth. So what happens is this is usually seen in infants and it has an effect on swallowing and speech because this frenulum is there. It is attaching the entire tongue to the floor of the mouth, so the tongue cannot move. So this causes difficulty in swallowing food, eating food and also speech. So what is done is a condition called as frenulectomy. It is a simple procedure in which that excessively long attachment of the frenulum to the floor of the mouth is cut and this is usually done very early in life and so that is what is called as frenulectomy. And finally, paralysis of the genioglossus you have to remember will cause obstruction of airway because if the genioglossus gets paralyzed, there is a tendency for the genioglossus to go backwards and obstruct the airways. So this is one important thing that if a patient is unconscious, you have to ensure that the tongue is pulled forwards. Otherwise, the tongue will fall back and obstruct the airways and will cause suffocation. So with this, we come to the uh, end of this lecture on uh, uh, tongue. So what are the things we discussed in this lecture? Let us have a quick summary. We started with the introduction of the tongue. There are two words which are related to the tongue. One is in Latin and one is in Greek. One is glossa. Anything related to the tongue is also referred to as glossa. Similarly, you have a word lingua which is also related to the tongue. Then we discussed the taste sensations. What are the various taste sensations we have? Sweet, salty, sour, bitter and then the finally the taste of uh, umami. Then we discuss the various functions of the tongue. Then next we discuss the gross anatomy of the tongue in which we discussed the parts of the tongue. What are the parts of the tongue? You have a dorsal surface, you have a ventral surface, you have a tip, you have a root. What is the root? The root is the part of the tongue which is attached to the floor of the mouth extending from the mandible to the hyoid bone. Now the dorsal surface of the tongue we discussed has two parts an anterior part which is the oral part and a posterior part which is the pharyngeal part. Then you have the tip of the tongue and then you have the ventral surface of the tongue. On the dorsal surface, what did we study? On the dorsal surface, the dorsal surface is divided into two parts, an anterior two-thirds and a posterior one-third by the sulcus terminalis. In the posterior part, there are two sets of folds, a median glossoepiglottic fold extending from the posterior aspect of the tongue, posterior part of the tongue to the epiglottis that is in the central part and on the lateral sides you have the lateral glossoepiglottic folds. In between the medial glossoepiglottic fold and the lateral glossoepiglottic fold, there are two depressions. What are those depressions called as? Vallecula. Okay. Again in the posterior part of the tongue, there are two folds like this. One is extending from the tongue to the palate and one is extending from the pharynx to the palate. What are those folds called? You have the palatoglossal fold and the palatopharyngeal fold and the palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal fold in between them what are present are the palatine tonsils. Okay, the posterior one third of the tongue has an abundant amount of lymphoid tissue. That abundant amount of lymphoid tissue together is called as what? Lingual tonsil. Okay, just in front of sulcus terminalis you see a large number of papillae. These are called as the circumvallate circum papillae. Where are the filiform and the fungiform papillae present? Filiform papillae are present all over the anterior two-thirds. Fungiform papillae are present on the sides of the tongue. So this is about the dorsal surface of the uh, 
tongue. Next we saw the muscles of the tongue. Muscles of the tongue we classified as two types. We saw about the extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles. What is the basic difference between the action of an extrinsic muscle and the action of an intrinsic muscle? Extrinsic muscles change the position of the tongue whereas intrinsic muscles change the shape of the tongue. Which are the extrinsic muscles? We have the genioglossus, the hyoglossus, the styloglossus and the palatoglossus. What is the action of genioglossus? Anterior part of genioglossus will cause protrusion, middle and posterior parts of genioglossus will cause depression. What will hyoglossus do? Hyoglossus will cause retraction and depression. What will styloglossus do? Retraction and elevation. So, these are the actions of the extrinsic group of muscles. What do the intrinsic group of muscles? You have the superior longitudinal, inferior longitudinal, horizontal and transverse. What will the superior longitudinal group do? It will make the dorsum concave. What will the inferior longitudinal group do? It will make the dorsum convex. What will the horizontal group do? Make the tongue narrow and long. What will the horizontal group of do? Make the tongue flat and broad. So, this is about the muscles of the tongue. Next we saw the nerve supply. Nerve supply of the tongue is classified into three parts. The motor nerve supply, the sensations of taste and general sensations. So, motor nerve supply, the, all the muscles of the tongue are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve except the palatoglossus which is supplied by the vago accessory complex. Taste sensations from the anterior two thirds of the tongue are carried by the corda tympani and these sensations reach the gustatory nucleus which is present located on top of the nucleus of tractus solitarius in the medulla. Taste sensations from the posterior one third of the tongue are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Taste sensations from the posterior most part of the tongue are carried by the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve. General sensations from the anterior two thirds are carried by the lingual nerve. General sensations from the posterior one third are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve and general sensations from the posterior most part of the tongue are carried by the vagus nerve. So, that is about the nerve supply. Then we discussed about the blood supply. Lingual artery is a branch of the external carotid artery, runs deep to the hyoglossus muscle and forms the dorsal lingual arteries and finally con continues as the deep lingual artery. Similarly, deep lingual veins, dorsal lingual veins unite to form the lingual vein which drains into the internal jugular vein. Additionally, there is an anastomosis of veins around the hypoglossal nerve. This is called as the venae commutantis around the hypoglossal nerve. They usually drain into the common facial nerve, but occasionally they can drain into the lingual vein. Next, we, next what did we see? We saw about the lymphatic drainage which is very, very important. Lymphatic drainage from the tip drains bilaterally to the submental group of lymph nodes. Lymphatic drainage anterior two thirds central parts bilateral drainage to the sub mandibular group of lymph nodes. Lymphatic drainage anterior two thirds sides of the tongue unilateral drainage to the sub mandibular glands of the same side and then onwards to the lower deep group lower deep cervical group of lymph nodes. And finally, we saw the lymphatic drainage of the posterior most one third which is draining bilaterally into the upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes from where lymph drains into the lower group of lymph nodes. With this, we now come to the end of this topic on the gross anatomy of the tongue. Thank you.